Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and jump in here. I wanted to do another message on the war of Gog and Magog. This is part two in that message. And um, it's, it's a very important message because we want to talk about this, this war that's coming at some point in the nation of Israel. And you know, we're on this, this 21 days of prayer for the nation of Israel where 5 million intercessors are praying for the nation of Israel. And it's such a very important time. And so anyway, I wanted to do this message in preparation for next, for this coming Sunday, which is the last day of the 21 days, which is uh, Pentecost Sunday and our time of prayer for Israel ends in. And also I, the, the, all that we've been talking about is related to Pentecost. So anyway, just wanted to, to do this message. As I talked about um, last on Sunday, and I, I just want to drill this into us is if you don't get Israel right, then your view of the end times is going to be wrong. If you don't understand Israel, then you're going to misunderstand the end times. And if you don't properly interpret Israel, you will misinterpret how God's end times plans are going to unfold. And so I think prophecy scholars are right when they said that Israel is God's prophetic clock that lets us know the hour of history and how soon the Lord is to return, and that they've rightly said, I believe, that Jerusalem is the hand clock and the Temple Mount is the minute clock. And so, anyway, that, that's what, so just again want to emphasize the importance of the nation of Israel. It's so important that we understand Israel, Israel's end time destiny that, that God has said uh, clearly in his word. And so in last, last message in part one, we looked at the who, the what, and the why of Ezekiel chapter 38 through 39. And so after that message, I concluded that, and again, not dogmatically, but I concluded that to me, it seems like this is, there's coming an Islamic Russian led invasion into the nation of Israel in the not too distant future. And so, um, and like we talked about on Sunday, is Russia's motive for attacking is economic, while the Islamic nations, of course, are fueled by Islam. And so that's what we looked at in part one. And again, I just want to reiterate as we get into Ezekiel, into part two of this message, the importance of not being dogmatic about uh, end time prophecy. I, I want to really understand the truth. I don't want to be glued to a particular view. I want to come to scripture and ask the Lord to speak. Okay, Lord, what are you speaking from scripture? What are you saying in scripture? I don't want my view to be held up as the view. God's view is the only view. And so one of the worst things that we can do in this day and age, I believe, is to be dogmatic to think, no, my view is the right view. God's view is the right view. And it's important to us to get God's view by coming to the text, by coming to the scriptures and just waiting on the Lord and prayerfully understanding and, and saying, Lord, show me what this is about. So Ezekiel 38 and 39 is a very complicated prophecy, very smart, intelligent scholars who love Jesus, who want to rightly interpret the word of God, have different opinions on who the nations are that are going to attack Israel, of the timing, which is going to be the subject of this message, um, of the timing of this invasion. And so I think, again, I say this all the time when I teach about the end times, it's far more important that we are ready than we are right. It's more, far more important that we are ready than us being right. So we can have all of our eschatology perfectly laid out and have it be spot on according to scripture. But if we are not ready as the bride of Christ, if we're not ready for the Lord, if we're not ready for the times we're heading into, then it doesn't really matter that much we get all the perfect eschatology nailed down. We want, I mean, uh, in theory, we want to have both. We want to have the proper interpretation of the end times and be ready. But it is more important to be ready than to be right. And so my goal in these four messages that I'm doing uh, is, is uh, Joel chapter 2, 15 through 32, Ezekiel 38 and 39. There's going to be four messages in total. My goal in, this, in these four messages is to raise your attention to say, watch for these things that could happen. I'm not saying dogmatically these are going to happen I'm saying, oh, I mean, these are going to happen soon. I, I believe it is, but I want to at least 
um, gets your attention to say, watch for, watch for this. There is coming a Russian-led Islamic invasion into Israel in the not-too-distant future. Watch for it. And if for some reason, if what I'm saying, the timing's off, then I'm going to, uh, you know, let you know because I want to make sure that uh, the, what I teach is of uh, integrity. And if I miss something, I want to let you know because, you know, we got to have the truth. we got to have the truth in this day and age we live in. And if I say that anything off in the timing, I want to acknowledge that and just say, hey, I was off on this. But uh, anyway, just want to lay that groundwork. So now we're, in Eze we're going back to Ezekiel 38 and 39, and we're asking when. When is this prophecy going to take place? And in my opinion, this question of when is definitely the most important as it relates to Israel, or as it relates to Ezekiel 38 and 39, is when will this happen is of utmost importance in Ezekiel 38 and 39. But I would also argue, as it relates to end-time prophecy, answering this question of when this, this takes place in Ezekiel 38 and 39 is one of the most critical questions we, ha we need to answer as it relates to end-time prophecy as a whole. Because... As I'm going to show, and I'll explain this in a minute, but as I'm going to show you, if this, if this event is going to be fulfilled before the tribulation, as I'm going to argue, as opposed to at the end, when you know, the Battle of Armageddon, as others argue, then you're, my, the, the different views you walk away with from the end times are going to be drastically, drastically different. And so we want to very, that's why I'm going to go through this very carefully, very slowly, um, so that we can understand that uh, we can understand the importance of this, and I just keep saying the importance. I'm stressing the importance of it, so that you will see. Okay, I need to study this. I believe Ezekiel 38 and 39, the answering the when question, is again one of the most important questions that needs to be answered in the time we live in. And so I just want to challenge you. It, to, to be a student of the Word of God, to go deep into the Word of God, and to dig into it yourself and just ask the Lord, okay, Lord, teach me this. I, I encourage you to also get the notes that are in the link in the description on YouTube and, and read through those notes prayerfully, asking the Lord to show you the truth. So, for example, if, if you believe, like, so what, what I'm going to do in this message, I'm going to show you why I believe this event's going to be fulfilled before the tribulation. And so I just want to give you an example. If what I'm saying is true, here's what I'm saying this, this, is, good, this is true, is if what I'm saying is true, if you don't believe God is the Antichrist and you, don't, and you believe this prophecy is going to be fulfilled before the seven-year tribulation period, then what, you, then what this prophecy is teaching is that there is coming a, an invasion into Israel soon and that after that a massive worldwide unprecedented revival is going to break out both in Israel and in the nations, causing millions and millions and millions of people to come to faith in Jesus Christ, including in the nation of Israel, and I believe also in the Muslim world. And that this is going to be, the, I believe, the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history. On the other hand, if you were to, if you interpret this prophecy being fulfilled at the Battle of Armageddon, for example, um, there's, there's five different views I'm going to walk through, but if you believe it's the Battle of Armageddon, for example, then that gives an entirely different view of how you think end time prophecy is going to be fulfilled. And so if you think it's the Battle of Armageddon, then you're going to think Gog is the Antichrist. You're going to think, okay, where it talks about in Ezekiel that God says, I will not hide my face from the house of Israel. That will not be fulfilled until after two thirds of the Jewish nation are killed uh, by the Antichrist. In other words, basically God continues this state of hardness to the nation of Israel all the way through until the second coming. And so at the very last hour when Jesus returns, then, then the remaining Jews who survived get saved. Uh, so the point is, the point of all that is, it also shows you that who the Antichrist or, or what nation the Antichrist would come from and his alliance, his coalition of nations, and it would also show that the role of Islam in his empire. So all that to say is getting the right view 
or getting the right timing of this prophecy is so important. So important. So I just encourage you, study these notes, study Ezekiel 38 and 39, prayerfully ask the Lord to show you uh, the truth and all these things. Okay, number one, there's some, or number one, I'd started talking without telling you what I'm talking about. There's, there's, there's several preliminary conditions that must be fulfilled before this prophecy can take place. Let's just step through these just for a minute now. Uh, number one is this prophecy, Ezekiel said, this prophecy must be fulfilled in the last days. Ezekiel prophesied to Gog in Ezekiel 38, verse 8. He says, in the latter years, the Lord was speaking to Gog, this military invader. The Lord said through Ezekiel, in the latter years, you will come into the land that is restored from the sword. So clearly we see here, this is an end time prophecy. Then we also see in Ezekiel 38, 16, is the Lord told Gog, you will come up against my people, Israel, like a cloud to cover the land. And it shall come about in the last days that I will bring you against my land. So clearly the, the, the first condition that we see in this prophecy, it is not something that happened after the exile from Babylon. It is clearly an end time, last days prophecy. And I think uh, most Christians believe we're living, at, we're living in the end times. We're living in the last days. So clearly this condition has already been met. The second thing here is, the second point is, this prophecy will be fulfilled when Israel has been restored as a nation and the Jewish people are dwelling again in the land. You can see this in Ezekiel 38.8 when the Lord said that this army is going to come into the land that is restored from the sword whose inhabitants have been uh, gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel, which had been a continual waste. But his people were brought out from the nations. And so you know the story of Israel. May 14th, 1948, about 75 years ago, the nation of Israel is reborn after almost 2,000 years of desolation in what I believe is one of the greatest miracles in 2,000 years. And so not only has Israel been restored as a nation, which clearly fulfills this part of the prophecy, but also over, over I think, over 6 million Jews. I can't, um, right now there's like 9.7 million people in Israel and 73% or there's actually the Jewish population in Israel is 7 million with 70, 73% being uh, Jewish in Israel's population. So clearly we're seeing, it's like a tenfold increase from 1948 until 2023 is clearly this prophecy is being fulfilled. So that means, okay, these two conditions have certainly been met. Number three is this prophecy will be fulfilled when Israel is prospering. We looked at that on Sunday in the last message where Gog is coming into the land of Israel because he has this, this motive in his heart. It's this desire for money. There's this desire for prosperity and greed. The prosperity of Israel allures Gog to come from the land of Magog, which I showed you last Sunday, I believe very well is Russia. He's coming in for this economic desire to capture spoil and seize plunder. And so what that means then is if he's coming into the land of Israel to capture spoil and seize plunder, that Israel must be uh, experiencing a measure of prosperity. And that is indeed the case in, uh, in 2023. You know, when, when Israel was first founded in 1948, the, the, there was so much that had to be done in the nation. And so it was definitely, definitely not a prosperous nation at the very beginning. But Israel has experienced incredible economic growth uh, over the last 75 years, the Economist ranked Israel as the fourth most successful economy for developed countries in 2022. For 2022, the IMF established or estimated Israel's GDP at 564 billion dollars. It's the 13th highest in the world, and so clearly we're seeing here that Israel is at the, at the is at the cutting edge of the technology industry, the startup culture, and incredible uh, advances in science and technology, uh, tourism and all this. So Israel is clearly beginning uh, in a state of prosperity. So you can see why Gog's motive would be there to invade the land of Israel. So again, this condition has also been fulfilled. Okay, number four, 
This is where some debate lies. Is the fourth condition is this prophecy will be fulfilled when Israel is living securely in the land. Ezekiel 38 verse 8 says that God would attack Israel when the Jewish people were living securely, all of them. And so when this happens, when this attack happens, Israel, it says about Israel in Ezekiel 38, 11, that they will be a land of unwalled villages who are at rest, that live securely, all of them living without walls and having no bars or gates. And so this part of the prophecy has a lot of debate centered around that because people go, well, it says here in verse 11 that Israel is going to be a land of unwalled villages. Well, don't you know that in the early 2000s, they erected that wall that's like 442 mile barrier that blocks off uh, terrorism and terrorists from coming in and things like that. So how can you say then that Israel, that prophecy is fulfilled because there's a wall that's 442 miles uh, in the nation of Israel to block out terrorists. And that's clearly been a huge thing that's helped them have uh, to cause the terrorist attacks to go down. So how can we say that that's actually a field? Israel seems like from this word, it needs to be a land of unwalled villages. And that doesn't seem like that's fulfilling the prophecy. And what I would say, and what a, a number of scholars say, and I think it's the truth here, is Ezekiel is not saying they're not, there can't be any walls in Israel when this attack happens. What Ezekiel is describing is the difference between ancient Israel, because ancient cities had walls that surrounded the cities. In fact, you can see Jerusalem has, you can see the remains of the ancient walls uh, around the city of Jerusalem. You can think about Jericho and all the different ancient cities that would have walls that would surround them. And then you would compare that to modern day Israel where there's no walls around any of those cities. So I think what Ezekiel is describing here talking about a land of unwalled villages, it's not talking about there can't be a security wall. It's, it's contrasting ancient Israel with modern Israel. And so I, I think that's what, I think that's what the, the prophecy here is talking about. Now, another debate centers around this, this understanding of what it means for Israel to be at rest and for Israel dwelling securely. So that is a huge debate in this prophecy. Um, some scholars believe, many scholars believe, in fact, that what Ezekiel is describing is alluding to Daniel 9, 27, when the Antichrist makes a seven-year peace treaty with the nation of Israel and other, other nations. Um, and so that, that's one argument. But I think if you really dig into this, um, as Dr. Arnold, Arnold Fruchtenbaum, hopefully I said his name right, a Messianic Jewish scholar I think he makes an excellent point in his book, In the Footsteps of the Messiah. He says this. I want to read it to you. I think he's right in this. He says, now these two verses, talking about Israel being at rest and Israel dwelling securely, these two verses have often been misconstrued as referring to a state of peace. However, this is not the meaning of the Hebrew word, which is the root word used for securely. This Hebrew word means security. This is not the security due to a state of peace, but a security due to confidence in their own strength. This too is a good description of Israel today. The Israeli army has fought four major wars since its founding and won them swiftly each time. Today, Israel is secure, confident that her army can repel any invasion from the Arab states. Hence, Israel is dwelling securely. Joel Rosenberg, who's written several best-selling fiction books about the Middle East and Israel and, and end-time prophecy, he also agrees with this view and says that Israel dwelling securely doesn't necessarily mean a comprehensive peace plan. He goes on to say in his book, Epicenter, note that the Hebrew prophet does not go so far as to say there will be a comprehensive peace treaty between Israel and all of our neighbors or that all or even most hostilities in the Middle East will have ceased. Which is it? Some have been tempted to ask, is it war or peace? You can't have both. And, and Rosenberg says, maybe you can. I would argue that we are seeing such a conundrum developing in the Middle East at this very hour. And so I think both Rosenberg and Frutenbaum make a really strong argument that when it talks about dwelling securely, I think that's very... A very good argument that it doesn't mean 
dwelling in absolute peace. It doesn't mean dwelling with no enemies or no war, but it means that Israel dwelling in the land is dwelling in a place of security, confident that their military is able to defeat their enemies. In other words, they're not threatened at this time of being exiled or driven out of the land. There's no threat there that they feel. That's, that's when this prophecy is fulfilled. It doesn't mean that all of our Arab neighbors are at peace with them, um, but it means they're, they're dwelling in this place of confidence, of security, of this feeling of trust that their government is going to, their army is going to take care of them. And I think as you look at from 1948, 75 years later, after Israel has been through the wars that Israel has been through, when it almost seemed like God, I mean, not seemed like God miraculously delivered Israel multiple times and defeated their enemies in supernatural ways, when it seemed like Israel was going to be annihilated. Um, after all this time, 75 years later, I think a good argument could be made that Israel is dwelling securely, even though there's still terrorist attacks, even though there's still bombs that are coming in and stuff like that, for the most part, there's a sense of security in the nation that, that they're not going to be invaded or attacked in such a way that they're going to be exiled or driven out of their nation. Now, consider some of these, consider some of these um, factors that has made Israel more secure. Saddam Hussein's regime has fallen. Yasser Arafat is dead. The Syrians have withdrawn from Lebanon. Israel now has formal treaties with Egypt and Jordan. The Abraham Accords that Donald Trump uh, helped establish in the 20, in 20, I think it was 2020, uh, established dip, diplomatic relations and promoted economic cooperation between Israel and several Arab states, including the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. And that Israel now has a well-equipped military and one of the top air forces in the world. So clearly, you, you can see, okay, Israel is, is, is way, way, way more secure than they were uh, when Israel became a nation. Israel, like I mentioned, Israel's built this 442 mile wall that has, has dramatically decreased terrorist attacks. And Israel also has the Iron Dome. If you've heard of the Iron Dome, it's this missile def defense system that's designed to intercept and uh, destroy short range missiles and artillery shells. So Israel has a strong economy. Israel has a strong relationship at the moment with the United States, although depending on who the administration is, it goes back and forth. So I think clearly you can look at this prophecy, this condition, and you can make the statement that this condition is either uh, being fulfilled or is very close to being fulfilled. I don't think it means it has to be the peace plan of the Antichrist in Daniel 9, 27. I don't think it has to be this, I don't think it even has to be a peace plan. I think, I think what we're seeing now, it makes this prophecy very close to being fulfilled. Okay, so that's the preliminary conditions. Now, what I want to do now is talk about, is ask the question, when will the war of Gog and Magog take place? And so we're going to go ahead and there's a slide here I want you to see. And uh, just to show you what this slide is and explain it just a little bit. It's in your notes, but it's also up on the slide here. Is you, you see there, there's five different opinions or views of when people think this prophecy is going to take place. So before I explain it, you got, just real quick, you got kind of the structure. You got this peace treaty with Israel that's for three and a half years. And you know, it's Daniel 9, 24 through 27. It's it where three and a half years, there's peace and safety. There's three and a half years called the Great Tribulation. And so the three and a half years, uh, the two three and a half year period, people call the Tribulation period, the seven year Tribulation period. Then you got the second coming of Jesus Christ. Then you got the thousand year millennial kingdom. And then, so that, that's kind of the framework here. And so the different views here are, number one is that, some believe that this prophecy will be fulfilled before the tribulation. That's the viewpoint I'm taking in this message that I'm going to argue from. Um, number two is people think this, this uh, prophecy is going to be fulfilled at the very beginning of the, of the tribulation period. That's number two, at the beginning of the first half of the tribulation period. Number three is some think this is going to take place in the middle of the tribulation. And then number four the Battle of Armageddon, at the second coming of Jesus Christ. Some people think this is going to be take place at the Battle of Armageddon. And then number five is some think that this is going to take place after the Millennial Kingdom. And so we'll walk through each of these views. We'll start with five and go back to one. Uh, before I do that, let me just lay out here 
five constraints. So when we go through this and we ask this question, okay, what has to happen before, or what has to, what does the timing of this event, what constraints does the timing of this event must meet? What are the, what are the, the constraints that must be met in the timing of this event? I've got five I listed here. Number one, we've already seen, is Israel must be dwelling in the land with a feeling of confidence and trust in her security. That would be Ezekiel 38, 8 and 11. Number two, Israel must have enough time to burn their enemies' weapons for seven years. It says in Ezekiel 39, 9, that Israel is going to burn their enemies' weapons for seven years. So they have to have enough time to burn the weapons. In other words, if they're in a state of war, if they're being attacked by the Antichrist, then it's going to be impossible for Israel to do it. So there's got to be enough time for Israel to have that seven-year period to burn the weapons. Ezekiel 39, 28 says that after the Lord defeats this invading army in the mountains of Israel, after this happens, that any of the Jewish people still living in the nations must are going to return. They're going to make Aliyah back to Israel. And so there must be enough time for millions of Jews still living in the nations to return to Israel. Number four, the fourth, can, the fourth uh, criteria that must be met is Israel must be able to experience a period of peace, prosperity, and restoration after this invasion. There's Ezekiel 39, 26, Joel 2, 19 and uh, 21 through 26, which I talked about in the last message. I believe Joel 2, 15 through 32, and Ezekiel 38 and 39 are describing the very same thing. And then number five, there must be enough time for a significant number of Jewish people in Israel to be saved and prepared as the bride of Christ. You can look at that in Ezekiel 39, 29, Hosea 2, 14 through 23, Zechariah 13, 8 through 9, and Isaiah chapter 4, verse 1 through 6. In fact, I would encourage you to read those scriptures. Read, read those scriptures. Right now, we are in the season where God has opened up the prophetic, the Old Testament prophets. Read Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39. Read um, some, of these some of these passages like uh, Isaiah chapter 4, Hosea chapter 2, Zechariah chapter 13. Um, okay, so those are the criteria that must be met by whenever this timing takes place, this criteria must be met. So we'll look at the first view here. Number five, the fifth view, the we're going to work backwards. The fifth view is some people think this, this um, Gog of Magog, Gog and Magog invasion is going to take place in Revelation 20, 7 through 9, because uh, those, that passage of Scripture mentions Gog and Magog. And so the view here is that this, this war is going to take place after Jesus has reigned and ruled over the earth for 1,000 years. But if you really examine Ezekiel 38 through 39, that view is impossible. And I'll explain why. Because after Jesus has reigned from Jerusalem for a thousand years, all Israel would have been saved. The Jewish people, every single Jew on the earth would have moved back to Israel. Israel would have experienced a time of unprecedented peace and the spirit would have already been poured out. So these four things that Ezekiel says will happen after the, after the battle of Gog and Magog has already happened for a thousand years prior to this. So there's no way that this is what's what Ezekiel said in Ezekiel 38 and 39 and what John said in Revelation chapter 27 through 9 are talking about the same thing. All that happened here is that is through the Holy Spirit, uh, the Lord moved John to say, that very event you see in Ezekiel 38 and 39, something similar is going to happen after the millennial kingdom, after the thousand year reign of Christ. But they're very different events. It's just prophetic uh, symbolism there to represent an invading army after the millennial kingdom. So they're definitely, I don't see how you can say they're the same thing. Or you could, you could say that, that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is fulfilled after the millennial kingdom. It just doesn't make any sense. Uh, the fourth view that we'll look at here. Number four is the Battle of Armageddon view. Now, I, I, this one to me has a lot of merit to it. And, and it's in fact a view, and I mentioned last on Sunday, that for about 15 years I held, I, I held to the view that I now hold before the tribulation, 
But for about a year or so, I embraced the Battle of Armageddon view, thinking that this, this event with Ezekiel 38 and 39 would be fulfilled when Jesus returns at the Battle of Armageddon. And I think there's some, some good arguments here. But as I really began to, to pray about it, as I began to really to, to study it, I, I just really felt, okay, I don't think this is right. In, in fact, I, I, in prayer about a couple months ago, I just was feeling like, okay, I think I, I taught this wrong. And, you know, we had a, a, a teaching on our end time class where I taught it from this perspective. And I had, I had, I had the video removed and taken down. And, and I just asked the Lord to forgive me for teaching what I think is now not the truth. Um, so this view believes that Gog is the Antichrist and that Gog and Magog is the battle of Armageddon. And so the, the idea here is that, is that when you see Ezekiel 38 to 39, the idea is that this is this, it's a three and a half year campaign against, the, against Jerusalem, against the Jewish state. It's, about a, it's a three and a half year campaign that begins at the beginning of the, the Great Tribulation when Israel is at peace after that peace of treaty. And, and the Antichrist leads that invasion. And then at, for three and a half years, this battle goes on. Jerusalem's captured. Israel is, is uh, conquered. Two thirds of the Jewish people die. And then and when Jesus Christ returns at the Battle of Armageddon, they, they view that Gog and Magog is the Battle of Armageddon. So that, that's the view that, uh, that some teach. Now, I think there's some, some good things to think about here. But th there's six, as I, as I really begin to pray about it and think about it, there's six problems with this view. And I want to walk through these carefully here. It's number one, and if you think Gog is the Antichrist, here's a huge problem. And this is why, this is one of the reasons why I shifted my view, my view back. Is number one, is Gog dies in the battle and is buried in the land of Israel, whereas the Antichrist is thrown alive into the lake of fire. And for me, I just look at that and I said, there's no, I could not reconcile this fact that Gog is destroyed in the mountains of Israel and the Antichrist is thrown alive by Jesus Christ into the lake of fire. And we'll look at a couple of verses here. Ezekiel 39, verse 4, the Lord told Gog, you will fall on the mountains of Israel, you and all of your troops and the peoples who are with you. He also told Gog in uh, the next verse, he said, you're going to fall, you're going to fall on the open field. Then in verse 11, 39, 11, the Lord vowed to give Gog a burial ground there in Israel, the valley of those who pass by east of the sea. And then in Ezekiel 39, 4, the Lord tells Gog, this would be a terrible prophecy to have. I will give you as food to every kind of predatory bird and beast of the field. That would be a prophecy you would never, never, ever want. So God tells Gog, basically, you're going to die in the open field and your body is going to be eaten by birds and by animals. Okay? So that's, uh, that's what God says about Gog. Now, in Revelation 19, verse 20, we see when Jesus returns... Jesus is going to throw the Antichrist into the lake of fire alive. It says, he says, he will throw the Antichrist alive into the lake of fire, which burns with brimstone. And so, to me, I just could not reconcile that. I was like, how can I, how can I possibly say these are the, like, the Antichrist is Gog, and Gog is the Antichrist, when Gog is clearly dies in this battle in Israel, He's clearly buried in Israel. He's clearly eaten or picked at by birds and beasts. Yet the Antichrist is thrown alive into the lake of fire. If you're thrown alive into the lake of fire, that means your body is thrown in as well. There's nothing for the birds to eat. There's no way you can be buried. And so when I just looked at that, I was like, I cannot reconcile that. And so therefore, I don't think this view is... Uh, is accurate. I think it's. I, I, I just don't think Gog is the Antichrist. Number two is the second reason I don't think this view has much um, is, is correct is that God destroys Gog on the day of the attack, whereas the Antichrist conquers Israel and is not defeated until Jesus returns three and a half years later. Listen to this. The Lord spoke through Ezekiel and. Ezekiel 38, 18 through 19, the Lord said to Ezekiel, it will come about on that day 
When Gog comes against the land of Israel, declares the Lord God, that my fury will mount up in my anger, in my zeal and in my blazing wrath, listen, I declare that on that day, there will surely be a great earthquake in the land of Israel. So you have this idea where the Lord says, it will come about on that day. On what day? On the day Gog attacks Israel. You see that? It's, it's this, God comes to Israel's rescue on the day Gog attacks Israel. There's not a three and a half year delay. There's not a series of campaigns, wage war against uh, the city of Jerusalem. The Lord says very clearly, it's on that day, on that very day when God comes against the land of Israel, then my wrath will be poured out. I think the New King James Version says it even more clear is it says, it will come to pass at the same time when Gog comes against the land of Israel, says the Lord God, that my fury will show in my face. In other words, the Lord's saying here is that on the very day of the attack, God then rises up in judgment. And so, I, just, just, just trying to look at this, that this, is, this is another one of my main reasons for shifting my view back to the one I hold now, is I just don't see a multi-year campaign against Jerusalem. I don't see any signs of God's army having success. Uh, like you see in the Antichrist for three and a half years, Zechariah chapter 14, 1 through 2. What I see when I read this is I see the Lord destroying this army suddenly on the very day that Gog attacks Israel. Mark, Hitch, Mark Hitchcock, a prophecy scholar that's well known, says that this battle is a one-hour war. You know, whether it's a one-hour war or a one-day war, I, to me, the scriptures are pretty clear that on the very day Gog attacks, the Lord rises up in defense of the nation of Israel. Now, another verse to me that confirms this is Ezekiel 39, verse 3, when the Lord says, I will strike your bow, talking to Gog, I will strike your bow from your left hand and dash down your arrows from your right hand. The idea to me from this scripture is that as Gog is attacking Israel, at that very moment, without having success, God defeats them as they are attacking Israel. See, as I thought about this more, I thought, okay, Ezekiel 38 and 39, if you read it, it is one of the most detailed prophecies in the entire scripture. It, it is so detailed. I mean, you think about some of the details. The Lord spoke, these are the nations that are going to attack. This is the conditions that must be met. This is the reason why they're going to attack. Uh, they're going to burn their enemy's weapons for seven years. They're going to bury dead bodies for seven months. You know, just incredible detail. And this is what's going to happen after this event takes place. I mean, just read it. It is condensed. It is so detailed. And to think that, okay, this, this has so many details. And to think that God would not have any indication whatsoever in this text that there was any success in this battle. There's, there's no picture whatsoever that Jerusalem's conquered, as you see in Zechariah chapter 14, 1 through 2. You, you just see there, there's no place here that says Jerusalem has been conquered or Israel's been conquered. It's, it's basically saying the opposite. is the very day uh, Gog comes into the land, that very day God destroys that army. It's on that very day. It's the same day war. It's a one-day war or a one-hour war. And so I just, you know, if, if that prophecy is so detailed and that huge information is left out, that would be, that's a huge context clue that is left out if it was indeed a, a campaign and if it was indeed this war that, that there was a measure of success where Jerusalem was conquered. That's a huge thing to leave out. See, I think... My conviction is, it is a huge assumption. It's a huge assumption to claim Ezekiel 38 through 39 is a multi-year campaign against Israel. It's a huge assumption to say that there was military success in Ezekiel 38 through 39. It's a huge assumption to say that Ezekiel 38 to 39 is retelling Zechariah chapter 14. I think that's a huge assumption. The text clearly does not say it. And so therefore, I just was like, 
I don't think that's what it's saying. I don't think what it's saying. I don't think it's saying that this is a, a multi-year campaign against the nation of Israel. Okay, number three. Is Gog invades Israel for the economic benefit, whereas the battle of Armageddon is a war against Jesus Christ? Huge, huge here. Because Ezekiel tells us very clearly, Gog is attacking the nation of Israel to capture spoil and seize plunder. Yet if you look at Revelation 19, 19, where the Lord, where John saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. In other words, Gog is going into Israel for economic benefit. The Antichrist is going to war at the Battle of Armageddon to fight Jesus Christ. So it's very different. It's very different. It's a very different battle. That's another reason why I don't think this view works. The fourth reason is is Gog is destroyed by God's judgments. Whether we don't know if it's infighting, rain, hailstones, or fire and brimstone, but the Antichrist is destroyed directly by Jesus Christ. And so here we have in Ezekiel uh, 38, 21 through 22, the Lord says this about Gog, I will call for a sword against him on all my mountains, declares the Lord God. Every man's sword will be against his brother with pestilence and with blood, I will enter into judgment with him. I will reign on him, talking about Gog, and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain, hellstones, fire, and brimstone. So from this passage, we don't know for sure whether it's the civil war. We don't know if it's the hellfire and brimstone. We don't know if it's the torrential rain or the hell. We don't know exactly what kills Gog, but we do know it's one of those judgments of God that kills Gog because the text says very clearly there, the Antichrist, on the other hand, is, is killed directly by Jesus Christ. And he's thrown, or he's, let me say it this way. The Antichrist, on the other hand, is thrown alive, killed by being thrown alive into the lake of fire by Jesus Christ at the second coming. Number five, Ezekiel 38 through 39 is likely the same event as Joel 2.20, which clearly takes place prior to the Great Tribulation. And so you remember in part one, I listed nine different reasons or similarities between Ezekiel 38 and 39 and Joel 2, 15 to 32. I listed nine different similarities. And so I, I, I believe there, these two prophets are clearly describing the same prophetic event. If that is the case, then Joel 2.32, which describes the time of Jacob's trouble, Joel 2.32 says that it will come about that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered. Um, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be delivered, for there will be survivors in the land of Israel. I'm kind of memorizing or saying it off of memory, but that's clearly talking about Jacob's trouble during the time of the Great Tribulation. So if these two events are indeed the same, I believe they are, that's telling us this, in this destruction of the northern army takes place prior to the Great Tribulation, showing that this is not the Battle of Armageddon. And then number six, th this one to me really, just thinking about this, just really touched my heart really, is if Ezekiel 38 and 39 takes place at the Battle of Armageddon, this would mean God would not remove Israel's hardness and blindness until after the Antichrist has killed two-thirds of the Jewish people. And here's why I'm saying that. Ezekiel 39, 29, the Lord says, after this army is defeated, the Lord says, I will not hide my face from them any longer, for I will have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel. Now, when God says that, what it means when he says, I will not hide my face from the house of Israel any longer, what that means is the same thing Paul said in Romans chapter 11. When Paul said that, uh, that Israel has been blinded, a spirit of stupor has been given to the nation of Israel. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. Where Paul said that a temporary blindness has come to the nation of Israel, temporary hardness has come to the nation of Israel. And when God says, I hid my face from them, 
He's basically saying, I temporarily rejected them. And that rejection has been going on for about 2,000 years. I mean, it's a long, 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 long period where God has hidden his face from the house of Israel. Yet Paul says clearly in Romans 11:15, there's coming a day of Israel's acceptance. And when Israel is accepted once again, and when Israel's blindness is removed, and when Israel's hardness is removed, then that will cause life from the dead to take place in a great revival in Israel, in a great revival in the nations, and in ultimately leading to the second coming of Christ and uh, the resurrection of the dead. But if you think about this, Jesus told the Jewish people, and he said, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me uh, draws him. In other words, to the Jewish people, it's like, you, you can't come to me. You cannot be saved. You, unless the Father who sent me draws you, you cannot be saved. And John, in John chapter 12, said, the Jewish people, many Jewish people in that day, they could not believe because God had blinded them and hardened them and made them deaf. See, God had hidden his face from Israel because of their disobedience, because of their rejection of the Messiah. God had hidden his face for them, and that, that hiding of his face lasted 2,000 years. So when I was thinking about this, if the Armageddon view is correct, it's basically God would be saying, God would be saying this to the nation of Israel. I just want you to think about this for a second. If God continues to hide his face from Israel through the great tribulation until the second coming of Christ, God is basically saying to the Jewish people, come back to the land and die at the hands of the Antichrist, who's going to be worse than Hitler. Yes, I will preserve one-third of you, but you won't know which ones of you have been chosen to escape and survive. I mean, I, I started thinking about that as like, oh, that's not right. That's not the heart of God. That's not the heart of God, especially, can you, I mean, can you really imagine a loving God who loves Israel the way the scriptures say God loves Israel with an everlasting love doing this, especially after six million Jews perished in the Holocaust? Basically, the Lord would be saying, okay, you just came out of the Holocaust, now I'm going to bring you into the land and you're going to have another Holocaust that's going to be even worse with no opportunity for salvation because I've hardened you and I've blinded you and I've hidden my face from you. I don't think the Lord says that at all. I think the Lord says through Ezekiel, come back to the land. The Lord says, come back to the land and be saved. He doesn't say, come back to the land and die. He says, come back to the land and be saved. And I'm thinking of Ezekiel 36, verses 24 through 25, when Ezekiel said, I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all the lands and bring you into your own land. Then, you got to hear that, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. See, the Lord promises to save the Jewish people and bring them into the new covenant after they have come back to the land. See, God is not saying come back to the land and die. God is saying come back to the land and be saved. There is going to be an, a very powerful move of the Holy Spirit prior to the Antichrist, I believe, that is going to lead millions, I don't know the number, a million or I don't know how a million, hundreds of thousands of Jewish people into saving faith in Jesus Christ. See, even though God will know, see, this is what I think God is, get the heart of God in this, is God is saying, I'm, I am about to do something in the nation of Israel. As you celebrate, as Israel celebrates their 75th anniversary, God is about to do something in this nation. God is about to defeat a northern army and a Russian Islamic army that comes against the nation of Israel. God's about to defeat this, this army that invades the nation of Israel. And when he does, God says, I will not hide my face from the house of Israel any longer. In other words, the day of Israel's acceptance, the day of Israel's salvation will be at hand. I don't think that means that every single person, every, every Jewish person then is going to automatically accept Jesus Christ. 
God still gives a free choice. But what God does in that is he says, now I'm removing the blinders, I'm removing the hardness, I'm removing all those things where you could not come to me and I'm drawing you to myself. But there will still be a number of Jewish people who will reject Jesus. There will not be a number that will say, no, we want the old covenant. We want the old religious order. We want the old religious system. We want the sacrificial system. We want the third temple. And they're going to still reject Jesus Christ. But a number of others, probably the secular Jews who are living in Tel Aviv and different cities around Israel, they're, that they're, not, they're like, okay, they'll see this invasion happen. Like, I don't really want to do the Orthodox Judaism thing that God's going to bring a, a, just a tremendous salvation to that nation. So you got to think about this. This is about the heart of God. This is about God's love and compassionate heart towards Israel and his desire for all of them to be saved. To me, I could be wrong in this. This is what makes sense to me, though. It would seem cruel if this Armageddon view was correct, that God would say, basically, come into the land because, and, and die with no opportunity to be saved because I still have hidden my face from you. So I, I just, I have a real problem with, uh, I have a real problem with seeing that, that being that view. Okay, I've got some other things in the notes, but just for the sake of time, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep going forward here. But I just encourage you to get the notes, uh, study the notes, and examine this for yourself. Because uh, I, I think this is, a, this is a fairly complicated thing here. So it, it, it takes some time for you to just read through it and, and ask good, hard questions here. Okay, the third view we'll look at is the middle of the tribulation. This, this view sees Gog as the Antichrist or even the king from the north mentioned in Daniel 11. Um, I don't think this view is possible because this, if, if it's talking about if, the, if this Gog attacks happens at, the, happens at the beginning of the middle or the, the start of the great tribulation, Israel would not be able to burn their enemies' weapons for seven years because they basically would be fleeing the, the wrath of the Antichrist. I don't think they would even be able, they would not also be able to experience a period of peace, prosperity, and restoration. So I just don't see the middle of the tribulation being a fulfillment of that. I don't think that's possible. Uh, the, the second view, to me, th this has some merit to it also, is the first half of the tribulation Prophecy scholar March Hitch Hitchcock believes that the uh, Gog and Magog war is going to take place during the first, uh, first half of the seven-year tribulation period. He views the Antichrist seven-year covenant with Israel as a fulfillment of Israel dwelling securely in the land. I think this is a, a pretty good argument because of that fact that this, is a, this, this peace plan would, would definitely fulfill uh, the condition for Israel, Israel to be dwelling securely in the land. The, the problem I have with this, though, is, is three things. Number one is this would not give, if you think about it, this would not give Israel enough time to burn their enemies' weapons for seven years because if it happens right at the beginning of the tribulation period, three and a half years later, they're going to be fleeing for their lives. So they would not be able to burn their enemies' weapons for seven years. The, the second reason that doesn't seems like I think there's a better alternative to this is Israel will not experience a period of peace. Ezekiel 39, 26 talks about after this attack is you will dwell securely. And so it would seem odd that this would only last for less than three and a half years. And then number three, this to me would not give the millions of Jews who are still in the nations enough time to make Aliyah back to the nation of Israel before the Antichrist attacks, which says is after this attack happens, the Lord says, I will bring you back and I will leave none of them there any longer. So this brings us to number one, before the tribulation. And so in my opinion, after just really, really spending a lot of time in prayer and seeking the Lord and just trying to get clarity on this, my opinion, before the tribulation is the best view for these reasons. Number one, it gives Israel enough time to burn their enemies' weapons for seven years. The second thing is it allows uh, time for the millions of Jews still living in the nations to return to Israel. Number three, it makes it possible for Israel to experience a period of peace, prosperity, and restoration after this invasion. 
The next one is it provides enough time for a significant number of Jewish people in Israel to be saved and prepared as the bride of Christ. And I just got to say this, God is going to have a significant number of Jewish people as part of his bride. It is, it is of utmost importance to the Lord for, to, to, for him to make the Jew and the Gentile one new man and Messiah, that he will have a, a Jewish Gentile bride as one new man. And right now, the number of Jewish believers as part of this bride is very, very small. I believe it's on God's, uh, one of the forefront of God's heart. Uh, his agenda is to make the Jewish bride ready. The next one is this view makes a clear distinction between Gog and the Antichrist. And then two more. The next one is this aligns with God's everlasting love and compassion towards Israel and his desire for all of them to be saved prior to the coming of the Antichrist. I don't believe all of them will be saved because many of them will reject Jesus again. But as God is, is giving them the opportunity, and I, I believe tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of the Jewish people will repent and come to Messiah, Jesus Christ. And, uh, but it's the heart of God here that I believe this view is just saying God's heart is for the, the people of Israel to be saved. And the final one is to me, this one's, a, this one's important because a lot of prophecy scholars wonder, okay, we see clearly in the scriptures that there's going to be a third temple. The Antichrist is going to go into the temple and he's going to claim that he is God. We also see the great tribulation is going to be kicked off by the abomination that causes desolation, which is when the Antichrist goes into the temple and says, I am God, worship me, and puts his idol, like we see in Revelation 13, in the temple and proclaims himself to be God. So for those things to take place, even Revelation 11 talks about the, the temple of Israel, for those things to be fulfilled, it, guess what? There's not a temple right now in Israel. There's not a temple. There's a temple mount with the Dome of the Rock and the al Aska Mosque, but those are, those are from the uh, Islam. They're not, they're not, um, there's not a third temple. And so prophecy is very, very clear there's going to be a third temple. And to me, when I think about um, this war of Gog of Magog, this really makes a lot of sense that it happens before the seven-year tribulation period because building a third temple, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm not an architect, but I would imagine it would take a lot of time to really sit, you know, to really get the blueprints right and the building plans right and to build this thing right. I think it's going to take a significant, I don't know how many years, but I don't think you can just throw up, pop up a third temple. I think it's going to take some time to build. It's going to take some time to get the Levitical sacrifices going. And I know that, um, there's, there's definitely a movement going on in Israel and the Temple Mount Institute and things like that. But my point is, is that this is going to take time. And then the other point is, is how in the world would it ever happen right now? Because that, the Temple Mount complex, that 37-acre platform there in the heart of Jerusalem is one of the most hotly contested areas in the, in the entire world. How in the world... Would that even be possible for the Jewish people to build a third temple there? It, it just, it wouldn't be a, possible except for what this Gog of Magog war is saying, that it's when Russia, it's when it, the Islamic nations come and God shows himself who the true God is. It's not communism. It's not atheism. It is not Islam. It, the, the, the true God is the God of Israel through Jesus Christ. And he shows himself and says to the nations and to Israel, I am the most high God. And when this happens, I believe Islam will suffer a great humiliation. And through this, I believe what will happen is God will allow, or God, through that, somehow, some way, I'll talk about it more on Sunday, but somehow, some way, that this event is going to allow the third temple to be built. So saying all of that, that's why I believe the Gog and Magog war will take place prior to the seven-year tribulation period. So let me just close with this. I'm just going to give you, this is a theory. This is not a prophecy. This is not a prediction. This is just, okay, if I think about this, how could this take place? Here's my theory of how this, this might work. 
I believe one of the main restraints against, uh, Israel, or against uh, Russia and Turkey and Iran trying to attack Israel before now is the strength of the United States. Because they knew if, if, if we go against Israel like this, the United States would stand with Israel in a heartbeat. But now that we see the U.S., and we're not there yet, but we're definitely beginning to be weakened, morally weakened, in, weakened in our government, weakened in our military, weakened economically. The U.S. dollar is, you know, many are predicting that it's no longer going to be the world's reserve currency any longer. And it's no longer going to be the petrodollar that, that gives us this strong economy. So, you know, and also you think about America, it looks like every day we're getting closer and closer to some type of a war with China. So all these factors in, it, it's clear that America is being weakened right now and I think that's given, this will give, as America continues to be weakened, and I believe we're being divinely weakened, I believe it's the will of God because of all that we have done for him to weaken us. I believe America still has a destiny ahead that God has a heart for America. I won't get into that. But America right now is being weakened. And so when America is being weakened, this Russia-Islamic alliance, I believe, will look at that and say, there's an opportunity here because America is being weakened right now. So, you know, just imagine the next three to five years as America becomes more and more weakened, that, that Russia and this Islamic alliance will be like, okay, America is not going to be able to defend Israel right now because they're in war, because their economy is, being, is in uh, shambles. Therefore, we have an opportunity. And so I could see something like this where this alliance tells the terrorist organizations that attack Israel, okay, stop doing it. We're, we're, there's a secret invasion that's going to take place. Stop the terrorist attacks. And so when that, when those, that terrorist attacks completely cease, then you could be in that fulfillment where Israel is dwelling security. So anyway, that's how I see that possibly taking place over the next five to 10 years. My point is this, here we'll end with this. My point is this, is whether what I've said is true or not, time will tell. God's view is the only view, not my view, not anyone else's view. God's view is the only view. If I have interpreted that correctly and that's right, we'll see, time will tell. But my point is what I want to say to you is begin to watch for this potential because if what I'm saying is true and the timing of it is true before the tribulation period, before the seven-year tribulation period, what that means, which I will talk about on Sunday, what that means is we are about to witness the greatest outpouring of the Holy Spirit in history. We are about to witness an outpouring of the Holy Spirit like we've never seen. We are about to see the prophetic ministry go to a level we've never seen uh, in, in a, I'm not saying ever because we have incredible examples of prophets in, in scripture but I'm saying in a long long time that God says I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh your sons and your daughters will prophesy your young men will have visions your old men will see dreams and God, God has no favoritism. He says, on the female servants, on the male servants, on everyone, I am going to pour out my spirit. And God says that he would do it after this, which is after the destruction of this Islamic army, this northern army that attacks Israel. So I just want to say, watch for this. Wake up and watch for this. Watch for this fulfillment of Ezekiel 38 through 39, I am pretty convinced I am going to see this with my own eyes. I'm 51, so I, I believe it's going to happen in my lifetime that this event is going to take place. And when it does, it's going to change the Middle East. It's going to change the world. It's going to change the nations. As God shows himself strong to all the nations and he sanctifies himself and magnifies himself and glorifies himself in the sight of many nations through his chosen servant, Israel. Amen.